one of the worst things you can do, and I've seen this over and over as we've helped people let go of their things, they let go of the thing without letting go of the emotion or the sentimentality mm-hmm. they've tethered to the thing. And that creates all kinds of additional emotional clutter or emotional baggage. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. I'm here with my good friend and co-host TK Coleman. Let's create a great day. Alabama's here. Hi, everybody. Nicodemus is in Montana, but we'll be talking about him in a moment. We got the rest of our team here in the studio as well. Coming up today on this free public minimal episode, we are joined by Dr. Bradley Nelson. He's the author of the best-selling book, The Emotion Code, and he's got a brand new book. It's called The Body Code. Dr. Nelson is going to help us talk to a couple of our listeners about their emotional baggage. Then we've got our lightning round segment, a fam's question, and a listener tip for you. You can check out the full two-hour maximal edition of episode 414, where we answer five times the questions, and we dive deep into several Simple Living segments. That private podcast episode is out right now at patreon.com slash The Minimalists. Your support keeps our podcast and YouTube channel 100% advertisement-free because, say it with me, y'all, advertisements Advertisements suck. suck. Yes, they do. Let's start with our callers. If you have a a question or a comment for our show, give us a call. 406-219-7839 is the number. Or you can email a voice recording to podcast at theminimalists.com. Our first question today is from Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah, a Patreon subscriber. I'm struggling to let go of the idealized mother figure I created as a coping mechanism for my childhood trauma. I'm looking for advice on how to process my grief and find closure. My relationship with my mother is quite complex. I've established boundaries to maintain emotional balance while keeping her in my life. Over time, I've been learning to detach with love, though it remains an ongoing process. Through therapy, I've come to understand that I created an imagined mother figure as a coping mechanism during my childhood trauma. Even at the age of 43, I found myself as recently as five years ago, believing that my mother's diagnosis of pancreatic cancer would somehow transform her into a closer approximation of this imagined maternal figure that helped me survive. Remarkably, my mother has defied the odds, surviving for nearly six years with stage four pancreatic cancer. She can thank chemotherapy and immunotherapy for that miracle. Additionally, her body is incredibly resilient. Despite finding a sense of balance in navigating this chapter of my life and its associated challenges, I'm struggling to let go of that idealized mother figure I had constructed. I've come to realize that my mom is unlikely to transform into that ideal, and this realization is causing me grief. I intellectually understand this, but my heart hasn't fully embraced it. Some refer to this struggle as the mother wound, and I've been working diligently to heal it by seeking fragments of that imagined mother in other creative ways. I'm grateful for moments when I've found these elements in my life. Do you have any suggestions on how I can help myself process this grief? I do have a therapist, but I face a unique challenge where my inner child yearns for my mother to fill that role, which might sound unusual or embarrassing, but it is my reality. My inner child needs to declutter this imagined mother figure. Your insight and guidance is so much appreciated. Now, Brad, I thought maybe we'd start with you here, and maybe we could talk a bit about trapped emotions. You mm-hmm. talk a lot about that. She's identified some of these emotions, grief being yeah. one of them, right? But also she wants to not let go of her mother, but she wants to let go of this idealized version of her that she's created. And mm-hmm. what we often talk about on the show is you actually can't love if you're not willing to let go, not let go of the person necessarily, although the, sometimes that's appropriate, but sometimes we have to let go of the expectation or the idealized version we've created of that person. Right. Well, <clears throat> there are really um, there are really two things that come to mind about this. First of all, uh, the first thing has to do with what we call emotional baggage, and the Emotion Code is the book that I wrote to explain that and how we can identify that emotional baggage and get rid of it. What I found when I was in practice is that all of the patients that I saw, no matter how young or old they were, and no matter what kind of issue they were dealing with, whether it was a mental issue or emotional or physical, uh, was they all had something in common, and that was what I came to call their emotional baggage. And 
what emotional baggage is really is it's the energy of the emotions that we experience that have not really been processed. So let me explain really quickly how this works. When you experience an emotion, uh, there's a process that you go through. Something happens, first of all, some kind of a stimulus occurs and you start to feel a certain emotion. Maybe it's anger, maybe it's resentment or frustration or grief or whatever it might be. Normally, and we, this happens to us all the time, uh, every day we go through this multiple times, we start to feel the emotion. Now, if you look at the body uh, from the viewpoint of quantum physics, what is the body? Well, the body is a very complex energy field. I mean, if you look at your hand and you put, a, put your hand under a big enough microscope, eventually you'll see that you're looking at an individual atom and you see the next atoms a long distance away. And if you look in the atom, you see there's really nothing in there, just empty space and energies that are infinitesimally small that are zipping around at the speed of light. So that's really what we are. So when you're feeling an intense emotion, if you think about what's going on on a quantum level, what you're doing is you're actually feeling a certain frequency, a certain vibration. Uh, Nikola Tesla said, if you want to understand the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration, right? And so when you think of emotions as vibrations, as these very unique frequencies, then it helps to understand how this energy can sometimes become trapped in the body. If an emotion, for example, is coming up for you and you decide you don't want to go there and you bury that emotion, you stuff that emotion, what it does is it breaks this little, what I call the emotional loop, where normally when an emotion comes up for us, we acknowledge it. We might feel the physical sensations that come along with that. We might think the thoughts that come along with that emotion. And then normally we just allow that emotion to be acknowledged and then to dissipate and to disappear. Right. And that loop gets closed. Well, if we interrupt that loop by either burying the emotion or allowing ourselves to become really involved and for that emotion to become really powerful, overwhelming, that also can break that loop. So we end up with these open loops of emotion. And um, in a case like this, I would very strongly suspect that there is emotional baggage mm -hmm. or trapped emotional energies. You see, um, what happens when, when that loop gets stuck open, the energy of that emotion that was trying to be expressed is kind of suspended in the body. Mm -hmm. And so in the emotion code, I talk about these, how each one of these trapped emotions is like a little ball of energy from about the size of a baseball to about the size of a softball. And these can lodge anywhere in the body and they will cause physical discomfort uh, oftentimes. In fact, 90% of the physical pain that people have is actually due to their emotional baggage. But also what these things do is they interfere with our ability to move on. Hmm. So they tend to make us feel those emotions. They, they will tend to anchor us into those feelings so that... Um, so that the grief that we experienced as a child, we can't seem to get over. It just keeps hanging there like an unwanted uh, guest, right? Um, and of course, there are many stories about this that I could uh, elaborate on. But I would say that um, there are there's emotional baggage that is keeping this alive for you. And um, and the other thing that I would say is that really it's about it's really about forgiveness. It's about, it's about finding a way to, to forgive um, this whole situation, to forgive your mother for not being, you know, who you thought she should be. And um, forgiveness really comes as a result of unconditional love. There was a great uh, podcast that I saw recently, and I can't right now remember the guy's name, but uh, he, talked, he was an emergency room doctor. And he talked about how um, normally in the, uh, in the ER, when someone flatlines and they die, they're only able to bring them back about 15% of the time, 85% of the time they're gone. And he said one day in the ER, they had three different people they brought back. And essentially they all said the same thing. They said, why did you bring me back? And then they all essentially said the same thing that the, for the first time in their whole life, when they died, they felt totally accepted. And they had to die to feel that. And I've thought about that a lot, right? When you die, you know, um, these near-death experiences, people talk about going into this field of unconditional love, right? Mm -hmm. Well, what's the fruit of unconditional love? Well, it's total acceptance, right? Mm. It's yeah. total acceptance. And so 
emotional baggage that we have about people in our lives that have hurt us, for example, will interfere with our ability to really truly forgive them. And really truly, really truly forgiving somebody is, it's not the same as just becoming indifferent to what might have happened or what they did to you. It's really truly forgiving and becoming at peace and really extending unconditional love to that person. And so, so my advice in this case would be to um, uh, either start working on yourself using a method like the emotion code or have someone start working with you. And you can actually ask the subconscious mind where that emotional baggage uh, is centered. Is, it, is there emotional baggage? Do you have trapped emotions? Uh, about your mother. I'm sure that you do. There might be some emotional baggage. I'm sure there is also about yourself and the situation. And you can address that kind of emotional baggage. You can start releasing that and it can have an incredibly powerful freeing effect on you because what it does is it takes the electrical charge out of that person's memories that you have or out of whatever it was that was done to you. And what that does is it greases the skids in a way for you to be able to forgive them. In the book, I think it's page 110, I have it here in front of me. This is from the body code, but you have the emotion code chart. And so I suspect that Sarah is dealing with more than one emotion, although mm -hmm. it, probably she, she, she may not be. But if she is, what you've done here is you've charted out where in the body these emotions tend to get trapped. Is that an accurate assessment here? Well, in the emotion code chart, we have two columns of emotions. It's divided into six rows. The far left column is actually, uh, it's really based on Chinese medicine, five element theory. And really what it's about is it's not so much where the emotions become trapped in the body, but it's more, uh, it's more a reference that shows you which emotions are being generated by which organs and glands in the body. Because what the Chinese believed anciently was that the, uh, the organs and the glands in the body produce these emotions, that they're... And that's what we teach also, that these organs and glands are frequency generators. And so um, if you're feeling an emotion of anger, very likely that's coming from the liver or gallbladder. Grief is probably coming from the lungs or the colon. And so, um, mm. so that's what the connections are there. What we have found, though, is that any emotion that becomes trapped uh, is like an energy, a ball of energy. And that can, those can lodge anywhere in the body. So from anywhere, any row, any emotion can lodge anywhere in the body. Uh, that's how that works. Wow. You, you mentioned with this loop, as we process our way to a closed loop, that we interrupt it through suppression, but also we can interrupt it through overindulgence. How yes. do you discern the difference between when you're doing that? Because sometimes you're processing these feelings and you start to feel worse and you wonder, should I just not think about this anymore? Well, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, um, as far as releasing them, we don't, really, we don't really need to figure out, you know, how we created that emotion. As far as being in the moment, the best thing to do is to try to be an observer with your emotions. And sometimes that's really difficult. Um, it's something that we have to kind of work on and develop as a skill in our lives. But is it difficult because it's so unpleasant, especially for these unpleasant emotions like guilt or grief or anger? Now, no one's like, oh, I really don't want to sit down and explore my joy. Like, it just happens. With these other yeah. things, we we pathologize anger in a way where we almost suppress it because we don't want to sit down and confront it. Well, right, exactly. Um, I think that, uh, I think in the moment when an emotion is happening, it's important to realize that you have an, you have an option. You don't necessarily have to be stuck in the emotion that's automatically coming up for you. You can choose a positive emotion. There are lots of those. For example, my wife and I have raised seven kids together and um, an emotion that we would frequently choose uh, would be curiosity. When mm -hmm. one of our kids did something, you know, radically dumb or mm -hmm. whatever, we, we would try to choose, okay, we can be upset about this, but let's try to choose curiosity. I wonder how long this child is going to continue doing stupid things. Well, I don't know. What do you think, honey? You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can change. You can choose a different emotion. Well, I do. Mm -hmm. I want to explore really quickly, I want to discuss the body code as it relates to pain. It could be physical pain. We also have a lot of people call into the podcast. We've done several episodes recently about gut health with Dr. Zach Bush, uh, people with autoimmune disorders. When you first came in here, you mentioned the um, grounding mats that we're all s seated yes. on now and uh, to try to reduce the inflammation. But 
I was wondering, with respect to the body code in particular, can you maybe walk us through some of some of the um, diseases, dysfunctions, and uh, how does the body code uh, apply to, say, one's uh, problems with physical pain or acne or uh, digestive issues? Sure. Well, let me let me go back a little ways. Uh, in 1980, I took a class. Uh, at college on computer programming. I needed a cl- uh, one more class to round out my schedule. And there was this class that fit the, it fit my uh, day-to-day schedule. And I, so I took it and I just became immediately enthralled and in love with computers. So I became a computer programmer. And then when I, when many years later, when I went to chiropractic school and became a doctor, uh, one of the things that was interesting was uh, in neurology class, I can remember our instructor talking about how the brain is really a computer. Mm. And, uh, and I remember sitting there thinking, well, wait, I'm a computer programmer. I wonder if we'll ever have the technology, right, to be able to tap into the computer in the body and ask questions because it should know what's really going on in our bodies, right? The computer should know. And I thought, well, maybe in two or 300 years, we might have that technology. Well, little did I know that that's exactly what I would be doing with my life is learning to tap into that subconscious mind, the internal computer within each one of us, which knows with a perfect understanding uh, why we're suffering, why we have pain, why we have all kinds of physical and mental and emotional problems. And the reason I wrote the Emotion Code book first was because I learned that the number one most common kind of imbalance that we suffer from is our emotional baggage. Mm. It causes all kinds of symptoms. But when I was in practice, I always had a computer there with me. And as I was working with people, and as I was finding new kinds of imbalances and things that uh, that I hadn't thought of before, I was always trying to organize those into this big mind map. Yeah, And I found some really interesting things. One of the things that I found was that my patients somehow already knew what was in my computer because the subconscious mind of each person is connected into the database of universal intelligence, right? Or what Rupert Sheldrake would call the morphic field, right? And uh, so that was really interesting. And I found that when I would, and, and this was kind of gradual process that took place over quite a number of years, but I came to trust the subconscious mind more and more. So that uh, during the last 10 years that I was in practice, most of the people that I saw had been told there was really no help for them at all, no cure for them at all. They were just gonna have to live with their disease for the rest of their lives Mm. and, and die with it. And yet what I found was that I had a secret weapon and that was their subconscious mind. And I could ask their subconscious mind questions and get answers. And as a computer programmer, that really helped me. See, I needed that training because what I found was that the subconscious mind is essentially a binary computer and you can ask questions. And as long as the questions can be answered with a yes or a no, like a one or a zero, the subconscious mind can give you those answers through muscle testing and through forms of biofeedback. And so it worked amazingly well. Uh, And it's funny, I remember once uh, I had a new patient that came into me who had some, you know, some really chronic, difficult, hopeless things. And I was feeling kind of playful. And I said to her, I I had just finished her induction and exam. And I said, you know, I'm basically clueless about what's wrong with you. And she, her eyes got really wide and she looked at me and looked really startled. And I said, but it's okay. Don't worry. I said, your subconscious mind, the computer within you, knows exactly why you're dealing with all these problems, and I know how to talk to it. <laughs> See, and so really, this is the paradigm that the body code uh, is really bringing to the world, and the emotion code too. That within each one of us is this computer, and we can ask questions, and we can get answers, and all the answers lie within us. Uh, the subconscious mind within each person is. Uh, is so vastly powerful. Uh, it knows, I believe, the history of you know everything you've ever done, every face you've ever seen in a crowd, uh, everything you've eaten or tasted or touched or smelled. I mean, the whole history of your health or disease is logged in that subconscious mind. And there's a list, if you will, within each person's subconscious mind of the things that need to be done, that mm. need to be addressed for them to be totally healthy and well. So if you think about it, it's a totally different way of looking at the body, really, than Western medicine. But see, most of the patients that I saw had been, a lot of them felt like one of those Velcro people, you know, where they, 
you, you throw things at them to see what sticks, yes. right? Mm-hmm. And that's how they'd been treated in Western medicine. And Western medicine is great for acute problems, right? Absolutely. But for the, these people that were coming in to see me, they didn't need drugs and they didn't need surgery. What we needed to do is figure out what was really going on with them, what the true underlying causes were. And so what the body code is about is it's about this, this whole idea and this method. See, when I was in practice, um, I was trying to catalog all the things I was finding with my patients. And eventually I found that I could categorize all these imbalances they were suffering from into six areas. And um, those are things like misalignments. Any tissue can misalign. And if you have misaligned tissue, you're not going to be as healthy as you can be um, or as you could be. Uh, There are toxicities, things that, um, you know, poisons that get into the body, all kinds of things. Um, There are circuitries. uh, There's the circuitry in the systems of the body. The body's very highly organized. The organs and glands have essentially what you might think of as an electrical circuit. You know, your gallbladder short circuits because you've been eating too many French fries or maybe feeling too much anger or resentment, and then your right knee starts to hurt. Um, Maybe you have, maybe you've been in an accident or maybe you've been feeling too much uh, too much fear or something, and that might affect the kidneys. And then your low back hurts. You might have fear about money. Money and low back pain go together. Mm. And I'm sure a lot of lights just popped on in people's heads listening to you because that's these are the things that you learn as a holistic doctor. And I've tried to outline all of these things in the body code. And so, um, so there are other kinds of imbalances as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, pathogens, viruses, yes. bacteria, fungal infections, we know about those. Um, there are things like trapped emotions and other kinds of things like trauma energies. So there's the energetic side of it. And then of course you might have some kind of a nutritional deficiency or something. Um, you might need a certain, uh, might need a certain vitamin or a certain mineral, or you might need maybe a certain essential oil or something. And so anyway, the body code is, um, is a way to figure out all of these things and you can do this yourself. And what happened, the reason why the body code even exists was because about a year after the emotion code book came out, which was in 2007, it came out the same month as the, uh, in 2007, as the iPhone, in fact, which kind of, <laughs> you know, gives you a frame of reference. But about a year after that, I woke up one morning and my mind was full of instruction. And the instruction was, you need to take everything that you've learned about natural healing and put it into a self-study course that anyone can learn and make it available to everyone everywhere. And uh, this did not come from my own mind. This came from, came from up above. And and I remember thinking, well, wait, are you sure about this? This seems like it actually might require some work. <laughs> it did. It took a lot of work. But now it's an app um, that runs on your phone that we call the Body Code System. And then we have the book, of course. And the book is really the uh, uh, the manual for the app. Yeah. And um, But anyway, you can... We, we don't have to be so helpless anymore because the reality of it is we're divine beings and... We have each one of us this incredibly powerful, I mean, this computer that we can't even begin to really wrap our minds around is the subconscious mind. And so we can ask questions and get answers. And within us, we have all those answers. We, the subconscious mind of each person knows exactly why they're suffering and whatever those symptoms are, whether they're mental or emotional or physical, if it's depression or anxiety or phobias or panic attacks or PTSD or eating disorders, or if it's some kind of another problem like maybe infertility or asthma or digestive disorders or some kind of an autoimmune problem or if they've got cancer. I mean, all of these things, um, and of course, physical pain, which is the number one way that the body communicates to us that there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, and what we've been trained, of course, and the way we're conditioned is to look at our, our symptoms as the problem, right? Right. And that's how Western medicine looks at it oh, you've got migraine headaches. Well, here, let's give you this drug. It's powerful enough that you won't feel the migraines, but if the drug wears off, you're going to have to keep taking them. But then that doesn't really address the underlying causes. So that's in a kind of Mm -hmm. a quick nutshell, that's what the the body code is about. I think what you said has so much potential to transform how we do human relationships because there is a part of us that knows no fear and that isn't governed by hate, resistance, and all of these things. And if we can just learn to engage those parts of one another, to speak to those parts of one another. My mom used to tell me when I was a little kid and I'd do something I had no business doing, she'd say, you're better than that, right? Which means that who you are is bigger than how you're behaving right now. And what if we apply that to the body, to how we feel, 
there is this part of you, though you feel fear, knows no fear. There's a part of you, though you are sick, that knows only wellness. And I'm not only going to address and acknowledge the part of you that I see, but this invisible part of you that knows only wholeness. I'm going to talk to you as if that's the essence of who you are. Man, the way we transform, the way we interact with one another, if we did that, just immense potential. And I'll, I'll say this to, to Sarah, you know, kind of connecting it to this question. You know, th- there's an analogy here with career. Sometimes in life, we find this distance between where we work today and where we want to be in the future. Today, I find myself working in fast food, but my real dream job is to be a pediatrician or a writer. And so I have this challenge. How do I motivate myself to show up in the place that I now am when where I really want to be is in some ideal place? And if I save myself for the ideal what happens is I suppress those parts of me that are capable of performing this transformative magic in the space that I now find myself. And some of the most beautiful stories are stories of people who found themselves in an environment that was less than their ideal, but they showed up with integrity and with creativity and said, I'm gonna give my all today. And they made something beautiful of it that no one could have imagined. And sometimes it was better than the imagined ideal. And that can also apply to the people that we deal with. When we wait on the people in our lives to become this ideal we want them to be, then we're not only saving, you know, saving our energy for them to show up, but we're also suppressing those aspects of who we are, how we can show up that can work a little magic. And so what I would say, Sarah, is what are you losing from your own self, from your own capacity to work magic by waiting for the ideal? And I still am skeptical about a lot of things, but I would have maybe six years ago picked up the emotion code or the body code or even the way that TK is talking right now. And I've been like, ah, it's a little too woo woo for me. Right. And then five years ago, um, I developed an autoimmune disorder and uh, started having tremendous, tremendous pain and inflammation and my whole body was responding. It was telling me something was wrong. I didn't know what exactly at the time, and maybe my subconscious did, but the doctors certainly didn't. And every doctor that I went to and spent hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of dollars through traditional Western medicine, which can be great. Um, But sometimes you reach a dead end or you only go so far. And it's like, oh, well, you go to this doctor for your small intestine, but you go to this doctor for your colon, you go to this doctor for your shoulder, and you go to this doctor for the knee pain that you're having. It's like, well, wait a minute. My parts of my body aren't standing in separate corners of the room. It seems to me that it's all connected. And so I've become much more embracing of alternative healing modalities, I guess we could call it, right? And so when I first opened up the body code earlier this year, I started going through it. You should see the copy I have at home. It's underlined uh, about 100,000 times and circled and like, oh yeah. Episode 400, when we had Ryan in here, we started talking about resentment and some resentments that he and I had felt toward each other uh, over the years that maybe hadn't been addressed until recently. And it's like, oh, what do you know? If I if I look at this resentment, where is resentment? Um, okay, I see it right here. It's uh, number four. Liver or gallbladder. Guess what? I have both liver and gallbladder issues. Now, is that a coincidence? I don't know, but it doesn't seem like merely a coincidence. Oh, I deal with anxiety all the time. I have stomach issues, including ulcers. Wait a minute. Huh. Anxiety. What else do I struggle with? Worry, despair. I get into despair because of the health issues, and then that then, of course, makes the health issues worse. Now, I'll tell you, Dr. Nelson, I have, I've improved 70, 80% over the last five years, but I've also reached a plateau recently where I'm now I'm really trying to figure out w- what else is going on here that I can address, not through traditional means, because to be fair, I think the traditional medical system failed me on several occasions. One is it didn't give me the cure that I was looking for, but also it probably played a significant role in causing the harm. I was on an antibiotic for 13 years. Oh. Yeah. And so uh, while I don't think that is the sole 
contributor to the health issues. It's certainly a contributing factor. Yeah. Sure. And you couple that with some emotional, some trapped emotions, some emotional clutter, and all of a sudden, now you you have um, you you have a an open platform for disease dysfunction within my body. Let's move on to some social media questions. This one's from Instagram. Judith has a question for us. My mother has gone through a lot of trauma over 81 years. I see how a lot of the stuff she's chosen to keep evokes strong but painful emotions. Should she learn to make peace with these feelings or let go of the things that hurt her? Mm. Dr. Nelson. Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting. Um, it reminds me of a patient that came into me once uh, many years ago. And uh, as I was working with her, what showed up was that she had a trapped emotion of resentment. Mm. And so uh, one of the questions that we ask when, when a trapped emotion shows up, when we identify one is we ask, do we need to know any more about this? Which gives the subconscious mind a chance for us to dig deeper if needed, because we're trying to help the subconscious mind to close the loop on that emotional experience. And we did need to know more. And she was about 42, and uh, it turned out, as I asked questions, that this had happened around age 18. And she said, oh, I know exactly what that's about. And I said, really? And she said, yep. It was this girl, this cheerleader from high school. She said, I really didn't like her. I had so much resentment for her. And she said, you know, it's weird. She said, even now, after all these years, if I ever think of her, I can just feel the resentment welling up inside wow. of me. And she said, I don't even really remember why I resented her so much, but... Anyway, so I tested and sure enough, that's what this was about, right? So I released the trapped emotion by just swiping a magnet a few times down her back. A couple of days later, she came back into me and she said, you know what? She said, last night I was with a friend of mine from high school. That girl's name came up in the conversation. And for the first time in all these years, I felt nothing. Mm. And so that in a nutshell is really why the emotion code is so powerful because it takes the if you will, the, the electrical charge out of these memories and things, it doesn't take away the memories, but it takes the charge out of them. And it's a simple, easy method. It's easy to do. Anyone can do it. But, um, but what I would say, you know, your mom is 81 and probably not going to be around too many more years. And you know, it's interesting because when I would when I would, uh, back in practice, I would be called sometimes to work on someone who was in hospice or someone who was in the hospital who was near death. And sometimes these people had been lingering, you know, for sometimes for months. And what was interesting is when I would go and work on these people, even though they were in a coma most of the time, the subconscious mind never sleeps. So I would still be able to get information from the subconscious and find out what the trapped emotions were. And by releasing the emotional baggage that these people had, Oftentimes what would happen is within two or three days, they would pass on, see, because it, oftentimes it's that emotional baggage that holds us here mm. and keeps us from being able to feel, you know, at peace and be able to move on and, and progress into mm. the next life, right? So, um, so Judith, for you, I would definitely say, um, you know, you can help your mom, you can work on her, your mom can work on herself, but uh, the emotion code is such an easy, simple method um, that, and it's, it's so simple to illustrate how simple it is. Let me tell you one more story. Um, we were at an event, uh, a few years ago, I met a woman who told us that, um, she started reading the emotion code book and her son started reading it and listening to it. And, uh, he started practicing with his friends and his mom didn't pay much attention. And about, uh, uh, two or three weeks go by and one day the phone rings and she answers the phone and the woman who's calling identifies herself as the mother of one of her son's friends. And she said, listen, she said, I have to talk to you. She said, my son has had a severe phobia of water all of his life. You know, you can have a phobia to anything mm -hmm. and get a phobia to water. And she said, it's been really disruptive to our life uh, as a family and to his life. And we've tried all kinds of things and nothing has ever worked. She said, right now I'm at the community pool and my son is out playing in the water with the other boys for the first time in his whole entire life. She said, your son did this. She said, how is this even possible? What in the world is he doing? But that's, those boys are only 11, see? But that's how powerful the emotion code can be. And so I, I feel for your mom um, having that emotional baggage that she's trying to 
you know, deal with, well, she doesn't have to carry it with her into the next world. You can, uh, you can be the product uh, of, you know, release for her and help her to get rid of it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's so good. You know, it, it's, it's interesting too, because sometimes the best way to help other people make peace with what they feel is by beginning with our own selves and getting to a place where we can be at peace with what they feel. When someone comes into our space and they're emotionally disturbed, it can also make us feel emotionally disturbed. And you can be easily motivated to try to get someone to get over their problem so that you can feel better in their presence and get back to having fun. If I'm having an amazing day and someone comes into the room and they're in bad shape and they're upset and they're complaining, well, we got to get back to my amazing day, man. So let's talk about your problem. <laughs> I know that I look loving and I sound loving on the surface, but hey, at the end of the day, the goal is let's get you through this. Yeah, I don't so, accept your emotion. Yeah, because man, I don't want you bringing it down. Let's get things back to a, a high level. So let's get you through this problem. Mm -hmm. But when you can get to a point where you can say, hey, look, you are free to feel whatever you need to feel based on where you are at this time. And I'm good because I know how to take care of me. Then you can get into that curiosity mode that Brad talked about earlier. And you can help her uh, achieve a certain level of peace with these things when you see her having these experiences by saying, tell me, tell me, what are you feeling there? And one Tell of the, a little more, yeah. One of the worst things you can do, and I've seen this over and over as we've helped people let go of their things, they let go of the thing without letting go of the emotion or the sentimentality mm -hmm. they've tethered to the thing. And that creates all kinds of additional emotional clutter or emotional baggage. Because, yeah, if I were just going to your house and steal your most precious objects, I guess technically you physically had to let go of them. But mentally, emotionally, psychologically, you might be clinging to them deeper than ever. And now you're actually telling yourself a story about those things. I'm, I've been incompleted by this theft. So hmm. when Judith asked this question, should my mom learn to make peace with these feelings or let go of the things that hurt her? Well, there are no shoulds here. It is possible to let go of a thing while still retaining the thing. And it's also possible to get rid of the thing and not let go of it. And that creates a whole bunch of emotional baggage. Mm. Right. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's interesting because um, when we think about the heart wall, one of the fascinating things that we found is that sometimes the hoard that a person has is actually an extension of their heart wall. And when that heart wall is taken down, mm. sometimes people spontaneously clean up everything, which is mm. really interesting, I think. All right, so before we get into the lightning round, TK, I want to take a moment to talk about the guests that we just talked to on the private podcast. It was a long discussion. We answered a bunch of questions that people called in with or wrote in with. But this is the first guest I think we've ever had on the show that we responded to a publicist pitch. Hey, would you like to have this guest on the show? And almost always I say no. We reach out to our guests. We find people we're really interested in. But I was fascinated by this idea of emotional baggage, emotional clutter. And then he had this new book called The Body Code. When I was sent it, I was hyper skeptical. Mm -hmm. As I am of just about anything that isn't mainstream, it makes sense to be skeptical about these things. But as, as I started diving into it, I became less skeptical in the same way that I'm less skeptical about someone who finds benefit from Reiki or from acupuncture, or one might even say from placebo. I don't know whether or not uh, the things we're talking about with every single time. <laughs> the problem with the placebo effect is that it works only if you don't know if it is a placebo. Yeah. But I do want to say that there were times where we didn't push back as much with this guest as maybe we could have. Mm. What was your experience with that? Well, first, I'll say I, I tend to be hyper skeptical, period, even if it is mainstream. I think it's healthy to just take everybody's ideas with a grain of salt and to scrutinize everything not for the sake of being a jerk or trying to outsmart people, but you ought to have your own reasons for whatever it is you believe, whether it's mainstream or not. And, and that kind of shapes my attitude towards the guests that we have on this show. I never see myself 
as being in a position of saying, hey, this is the one person that has all the answers and we should just mindlessly absorb everything they say. I look at it as like, hey, here's a person with an interesting perspective. We should assume they've got some things that aren't going to work for you. And maybe they've got some things that are worth trying for you because they can lead to interesting discoveries. Let's give them an opportunity to tell their stories, to share their ideas, to offer up their experiences. And then we can make our own decisions about how we're going to think critically and creatively about the way we apply that in our own lives. And so I had a lot of fun talking with him. I think if we had more time or if we had him back, I probably would ask him and I'll probably make it more of a habit to ask future guests, hey, what do you think is the best thing that can be said against your position? I love when we had Destiny on here and you posed that question to him and Destiny was like, boom, he gave an answer to that question really fast. And it might've been more articulate than what many of his detractors or debating opponents would have said. And I think that's a good question to get everybody to ask because it's, it's a fun one to think about. What's the best thing that can be said against your idea? And what is your response to that? That'd be something that I'd ask him. I, I think that could be a, a fun topic. And when I was diving into the book and underlying things, the, the thing that I found really fascinating is the connection between pain in the body and the emotions that we have. Yeah. And I have no doubt that there is this, this effect that we can cause pain in ourselves by clinging to a lot of this emotional baggage. And I think ultimately that's what came through in the conversation today, whether or not the tips and the techniques and the advice that Dr. Nelson has, I don't know, the jury is still out on that for me, but I am beginning to learn about the connection of, oh man, maybe I've been holding on to this despair for too long or forlorn or fear, or maybe I'm holding on to resentment that's causing other issues in my life, not just the psychological anguish, of Kapil's philosophy, where it's beware of prescriptions, right? There is a you that knows what's best for you beyond what some external source of authority can prescribe. And it's always good to be reminded of that. And I love when he talked about the subconscious mind and engaging that part of people that knows for themselves what they need and how he was willing to say, look, sometimes people came into my office with problems and I had no clue what the solution was. And I was very blunt about that. Like, that's something to remember. There's no expert that's got all your answers. And there are some answers that are going to have to come from you. And even if another person tells you what to do, the responsibility for actually following through on that is going to come from you. And I loved his uh, pointing that out. Let us know in the comments what you thought about the discussion. If you want to check out the full private podcast on Patreon. You can do that as well. Patreon.com slash The Minimalist. Malabama, what time is it? You know what time it is. It's time for the lightning round where we answer your questions from TikTok. Yes, indeed. You can follow The Minimalist on TikTok and Instagram and Facebook and X and threads. We are at The Minimalist on all of those platforms. Now, during the lightning round, we each have 60 seconds to answer your question with a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. We put the text to these minimal maxims in the show notes so you can copy and share our pithy answers on social media if you'd like. Today's question is from S-M-N-R-F-A. I don't know what that is. Let's we'll call him Smurnfa. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I always want to declutter, especially after I watch your TikTok videos. I begin to declutter little by little, but then I hit a wall, procrastinate and stop because I know I'll never have the perfect home. There are definitely emotional issues that surface whenever I start to let go. How do I eliminate this emotional clutter so I can keep going? TK, let's talk about these emotional issues. Yeah, you know, external clutter is a... We often have to unpack our psychological baggage before we can effectively declutter the physical stuff. It reminds me of the horror movie Child's Play where you have this occultist who's running from the cops. He runs into a child's store and just as, just as they're getting ready to catch him, he decides to do this magic trick, if you will, by inserting his consciousness into a doll so he can hide from the cops. And then at a later time, he can reclaim a different body and you get a whole horror movie based on this. And in our lives, we turn our lives into horror movies by outsourcing our consciousness into objects, into the things that we own. And the way we overcome that is not by throwing away the things, 
but making sure we take our power back from those things before we get rid of them because we get the power to let them go when we realize that we are not defined by what we owned or by what was given to us or by other people's reaction to us because of our possessions. You know, Charles Play is my favorite documentary. I don't even want to get into your childhood. If you think that was a documentary, I don't even want to talk about that. Shout out to Chucky. All right, I got something pithy for you. You needn't be flawless to be finished. Quite often, we think about the perfect home as this question asker is asking, oh, I don't even want to do this because the thought is I will never have a perfect home. And we associate being perfect with being flawless. But being perfect just means that you're finished, that you're done. And every day will then eventually be done, completely done. Perfect. Even though the day wasn't flawless, I haven't had any flawless days in my life. They all end. And recognizing that, oh, you know what? This is going to end. So would the best version of me hold on to this excess stuff? Would the best version of me continue to add more clutter to my home? Would the best version of me refuse to deal with this and continue to hide the clutter by organizing or ignoring it? Or would the best version of me say, you know what? It's never going to be flawless, but I will be finished. I have to get started right now. We're going to answer another question here in a moment from the fams that we recently had. But first, uh, real quick for right here, right now, here's one thing that's going on in the life of the minimalists. Actually, I got two things for you, TK. Uh, One is TK is finishing up his first book. Oh, yeah. It's called Emotional Clutter, and you can download it for free at theminimalists.com right there on the resources page or If you're on our email list, you'll be the first to know about it. Theminimalists.email. We'll never send you spam or junk or advertisements. We will send you our show notes each week with all of our minimal maxims and all the links that we talk about throughout each show. But then we'll also send you the Emotional Clutter ebook, a beautifully designed, beautiful ebook about dealing with all of this emotional baggage. And and by the way, Josh is trying to hold me back. This is why I need Ryan here. So (laughs) I need all y'all to let me know. If you want an R&B album to come out alongside the Emotional Clutter book, let me know. Get in the comments. I might do a single or something like that. (laughs) Let me know if you want a little Brian McKnight to go along with your Emotional Clutter ebook. (laughs) Tacoa McKnight. (laughs) Well, speaking of Nicodemus, he's going to be in town really soon. We were trying to do a live event, uh, another Sunday symposium, but the venue we use has been completely booked up. So unfortunately, we're having to abandon the live event, the Sunday symposium. But don't worry, we're working on a few live events for next year. So make sure you're on our email list and we'll let you know when we're coming to a a city or town or bookstore near you. Theminimalists.email. For that, Alabama, let's check in with our fams the first Friday of every month. We call it the Friday Afternoon Minimalist Zoom. We hop on with our Patreon subscribers. We do a Zoom call with you. You can, of course, be a fly on the wall. You can turn off your camera, turn off your mic, and just witness the goings on, the proceedings. Or you can participate in the call as well. So you can join us, patreon.com slash the minimalist. But while we're there, we have some folks that are participating in the chat. We can't get to every question. So Alabama has been collecting those questions. What do you got for us today? I have a question here from Chris. Why does our culture seem to discourage stillness or boredom as a valid state of being? There is a general feeling that we could always be doing, achieving, or pursuing something. Is it essential to dedicate a period of time to be totally still without the need to be busy. I find a lot of value in stillness, especially when I feel like I don't want to be still. The irony of stillness, TK, is whenever I slow things down to the point where I feel still, you notice how fast everything is, how fast everything around you can be. I've done stillness meditations before, guided meditations, and you realize that the nature that we perceive as so still is still moving. It's flowing. The, the river is not still. It's moving. The yeah. tree is not still. The wind is brushing through its leaves and, and causing this, this rustling of, of the leaves and the branches. And you get the sounds and how 
busy. Even the still world can be. But we ignore that because we are so busy, busy. about less. And then we got this article here from The Guardian. I wanted to read this because I think it perfectly answers Chris's question, and then maybe we could talk about it. Shocking but true. Students prefer jolt of pain to being made to sit and think. Report from psychologists at Virginia and Harvard universities tackles the question of why most of us find it so hard to do nothing. It was not so much how hard people found the challenge, but how far they would go to avoid it that left researchers gobsmacked. The task? To sit in a chair and do nothing but think. So unbearable did some find it that they took up the safe but alarming opportunity to give themselves mild electric disagreeable, he opted for a shock 190 times. Under the same conditions, a quarter of women press the shock button. The difference, scientists suspect, is that men tend to be more sensation-seeking than women. The report from psychologists at Virginia and Harvard universities is one of a surprising few to tackle the question of why most of us find it so hard to do nothing. But not just do nothing, We can't do nothing for 15 minutes without needing some sort of stimulation, even if that stimulation is painful. And so when I get back specifically to Chris's question here, why does our culture seem to discourage stillness or boredom as a valid state of being? It's because we've been so infused with that busyness and and the distraction economy. What happens is when we remove all distractions, we start to panic. It's almost like we've removed something that felt so essential to us, but then you realize I'm actually getting the nourishment from the stillness. What are your thoughts, TK? Yeah, man. I mean, every unhealthy practice has its rewards and, and a preoccupation with busyness is no exception to this. I mean, busyness protects us from a lot of things. It, it, it keeps us uh, from feeling irresponsible from looking irresponsible to others. I mean, one of the benefits of of working remotely for so many people after the lockdowns is that they were able to separate what they actually produced from the way they need to look like they're performing when they're at their jobs. Because when you're at a a job and you're visible and and people can see you, you kind of got to look like you're busy. And everybody knows what that means for their particular work culture. There are just certain actions if you're not taking people are going to question whether or not you're relevant. So we learn all these ways to justify our existence. And busyness is a great way because even if you're not producing results, at least it looks like you're trying. At least it looks like you're making an effort. Uh, And in addition to that, what happens if you take away my smartphone, take away the video game, the television, all these external sources of stimuli, and you sit me alone in a room for 15 minutes? I got to be confronted with the fact that I don't know what to do with myself. I actually don't have any thoughts. And I have a whole bunch of feelings, but... I don't have any tools for what to do with this. I don't have any refined ideas for what inferences I should make about these feelings. This is really frightening. Give me something that flashes and turns on and off really quickly so I can stimulate myself out of an awareness of my real existential angst that is underneath the surface. And so busyness protects us a lot from that. And so part of it is the solution is not just condemning people for using business busyness as a defense mechanism, but helping people develop the skills for how to be, because doing nothing is an art form. You know, it, it takes a certain mindset and a certain ability to be present that has to be practiced. You just helped me realize something with what you were saying there. What we're afraid of isn't the stillness. We're afraid of the awareness. Mm-hmm. And we cut because that awareness can be terrifying. existential angst that we might have. You know, Pascal yeah. said, he, he said that uh, all of man's problems stem from his inability to sit alone quietly in an empty room. And that's exactly the heart of Chris's question. Why can't I sit alone quietly? Well, you're, there's even one guy here who shocked himself 190 times just to avoid the solitude, the stillness. 
I need some sort of stimulation, even if it feels like it's going to kill me. We got a lot more to talk about, but first, Malabam, what do you got for us? Here's a minimalist insight from one of our listeners. Hi, guys. This is PK from Copenhagen. I am a rather new minimalist, and I'd like to share a tip with you that I use. So I keep on my phone three lists, and the first list I call minimizing. It's basically a list where every time I think of an item in my home, which I could actually get rid of, I put it on this list because maybe I'm not at home at that moment or I don't have the time when I think of it to actually get rid of it. So when I do have the time to minimize, I look at this list and the decision has already been made and I find it quite easy to then gather the items on that list and and get rid of them. So my second list I call uh, consumer purchases, which is, as the the name explains, my consumer purchases, when I do make some, I put them on this list and I find that it kind of holds me accountable and makes me consider, okay, so why do I do I make this purchase? And I need to put it in the list. I need to, to face it myself that I did make this purchase and be um, fine with that. But my favorite list is the one I call my almost purchases. So this is a list of all the things which I almost got uh, at the store, online, on impulse quite often. And it's a long list. And it's a list of all the things where I just said to myself, okay, I'll give it a week. I'll just think about it until tomorrow. I'll just put it off. And When I look at this list, it helps me see a pattern in the things that I would be most likely to buy on impulse, but it also shows me a long list of things I really didn't need. So when I look at it, I do feel, I guess, a bit proud of myself that I actually didn't make these purchases and they confirm that I don't need them and they would just have become clutter and they do help me recognize a pattern so when I'm at the store or uh, browsing online, um, it's easier for me to spot the things that would end up on this list. So yeah, hope this tip might be helpful for some. And thank you for all your great podcasts. Bye. All right, y'all. We'll see you on Patreon for the full two-hour maximal edition of episode 414, which includes answers to a bunch more questions like, what's your number one tip to avoid emotionally charged impulse purchases? If emotional decluttering had a soundtrack, what would it sound like? Why does JFM homeschool his daughter instead of sending her to public school? And what's one example of an advertisement you actually do like? I'll just say, well, maybe I don't hate it as much as other advertisements. Mm. We'll talk about that today. Also, <laughs> plus, we got a bunch more on the private podcast. Also, a private minimalist home tour from one of our listeners. A decluttered dining room that went from overwhelmed. Talk about emotional clutter, emotional baggage. That overwhelm of stuff creates a lot of emotional baggage. It went from overwhelmed to elegant. Plus, much, much more of less. And if you want to hear all that, Head on over to patreon.com slash the minimalist or click the link in the description to subscribe and get your personal link so that our weekly maximal episodes play in your favorite podcast app. You also gain access to all of our podcast archives all the way back to episode 001. And if you're still on the fence, Patreon is now offering free trials. So if you'd like to test drive our private podcast, you can join for seven days. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. Peace. Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing that's just feeding your greed. Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it.